Okay. And I'm going to share now also my slides. Okay, can you see? Uh, can you see the slides already? Let me see. It works perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, so let's start. So this is the second part of uh, the, the, um, the lecture on elasticity and dislocations in material science. I'm doing part two, uh, David is doing part one. So my part is now really on dislocations while part of um, David was more on elasticity, but uh, David will also give a lecture then at the very end of this block, uh, which is also on dislocations. Just a few words uh, about myself uh, for the ones who don't know me. Um, my name is Lorenz Romana. I'm a physicist by education. I started working on dislocations uh, in the year 2007 when I came to Leoben and I joined a group of uh, Claudia Ambostraxel and I was working also with Reinhard Pippan on dislocations in refractory metals, um, simulation of screw dislocations and that got me really into this topic of dislocations and it's still always a research topic uh, which i'm developing yeah from my i came from theo graz uh, where i did my education in physics and i went more into computational uh, uh, physics during my phd already with dft and then i moved to more uh, uh, leoben relevant uh, topics when i came to leoben working on plasticity and structural materials in general. Since uh, December, I'm now part of the university. I got a professorship uh, on computational materials science. And so I'm uh, uh, now part of the university, uh, but I was giving this lecture already now uh, for like six years or so together with David. So we have already some experience in giving this lecture. If you have any questions, you uh, can just interrupt me or just ask. We are a small group here, so there is no problem. I can also answer your questions all the time if you want to know something. Okay, so let me just go shortly through the menu, right? <laughs> what do we have uh, in the second part on these locations? Today, I also give you the, the, the day when I plan to treat the topic. So you can also see um what my plan is if you have any problems with this uh we should discuss it so um we i got the message that we should run over easter over, over easter break so that's what i'm doing here um and there is one lecture that i will not uh use which is the 11th of may you will see it later where i am at the thermal conference but maybe we can just have a short uh, feedback round uh, after this uh, short uh, presentation of the contents. All right, so uh, I will start today um, with an introduction, which is uh, starting with a short historical overview on these locations, how they were actually discovered uh, and how the theory was developed uh, and started in, in the beginning. Then I will go to the second uh, part, which is uh, a few slides on basic properties of these locations. And then the last block, which I hope to finish also today is on uh, observation of these locations to uh, show you how these locations are uh, observed in reality. So this is part of today's lecture. Um, for the next lecture, which will take place next week, uh, we will plunge into linear elastic uh, description of these locations. So we will assume uh, that we have a linear elastic homogeneous medium. You can imagine a sponge, for example, and that we create a dislocations inside a dislocation inside of the, the sponge, and then we can actually see what stress, strain, and displacements are and how the energy can be calculated for this location. And also uh, how about a combination of these locations, um, how to add Burgess vectors and how these locations dissociate. So we will treat that in uh, with Frank Rule. That is uh, the, the, the plan for next week. Then we will have on 27th of, uh, of, of April, 
we will have uh, this location structure in crystals. So we will move and, and go now towards real materials, which are composed by atoms and uh, many materials. Most materials are crystalline. So we have a crystal. And in such crystals, these locations um, look similar to um, these locations in a linear elastic medium. If you go away from the core, but inside of the dislocation core, um, there are some specific things which have to be taken into account. And I will show you how that can be done based on the Piers Navarro model, which was historically the first to treat real dislocations in crystals. And then I will also uh, tell you a little bit about other ways of doing modeling of dislocations based on semi empirical methods or also DFT um to show you how in reality in practice nowadays these locations are calculated and i will treat two crystal structures more precisely because they are very relevant uh, these are the fcc uh, metals and the bcc metals and you will see actually that um, the crystal structure matters a lot for the dislocation it determines the slip plane it determines the burgers factor so many things actually follow from the crystal structure so it's very important to think first about what crystal structure do i have and then you can derive a lot of uh, property of these locations directly from the crystal structure and i will treat two uh, crystal structures uh, in this lecture there are many more crystal structures which can also be treated sometimes students like to take this as their topic uh, for example hcp um, but there are even other uh, crystal structures which uh, also have these locations inside like silicon for example um, which are also very relevant yeah but this will be part then of basically two sections uh, one uh, on 27th of April and the other one of 4th of May. And then uh, 11th of uh, uh, May, uh, we will skip. And then on 18th of May, we will have uh, everything about motion of this location, which is really, really important because essentially these locations are the carriers of plastic deformation. And uh, that is always connected to the, to the motion of this location. And we will see force on this location, the pitch curl force. We will also discuss the three different ways how this location move, glide, climb, and cross slip. We will also discuss the defects on the dislocation uh, line because they are re uh, relevant for motion. We will see dislocation velocity, and also we will uh, see uh, dislocation generation from grid sources to also understand how these location are. Uh, uh, being created in materials. And then for the last um, uh, lecture that I will give, um, we will shift gears and go more into what are macroscopically observable phenomena which are related really to these locations and interaction of these locations with defects. Uh, I will just uh, yeah discuss a little bit um, critically resolve shear stress because that's relevant if you do a macroscopic tensile testing. Uh, we will see work hardening and um, the relationship of work hardening with dislocation properties. I uh, usually I also uh, do a little bit on temperature and strain rate dependence on BCC metals in BCC metals because that also really depends on single dislocation. And this year I would like to give you also a little bit um, uh, insights into solid solution strengthening. So the effect that if you add solids to the, um, the, the crystal and you have this disorder inside that then you also actually influence this location motion and also the stress that you require to drive this location through material. It's not on the list here, but I, I think I will add a few slides on that as well. Then on 1st of June, uh, presumably there is the lecture of uh, David on uh, dislocations in epitaxy, um, which is then the last lecture on dislocations. And then there will be the student presentation uh, on 8th of June and 15th of June. Uh, and if we need maybe even a third uh, date, we can take the week afterwards. 
Maybe uh, we can just make a very short round. Is this program fine with you? Are the dates okay for you? Sounds good from my perspective as well. Yeah. So if you have any problem, please, um, please just say it now. You can also write it. I will put the dates again on Moodle so everyone is informed. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, in the end, um, I, this would be my proposal for doing the lectures. If there is any problem, please just then answer through Moodle and we will find a solution. Uh, regarding the student presentations, I think that was also discussed, right? So um, uh, I think some students, or I've seen on Moodle that some students have already taken the, the topic. Uh, yeah, please, all of you uh, take the topic. If you need help in making a good choice, uh, you can also ask me directly. Um, I can also propose a topic if you want. Uh, I can just give you one small recommendation for the student presentation. Keep it really simple. Uh, please focus on one phenomena or on one um, aspect of these locations or elasticity that you want to explain. You only have eight slides. You have a very limited amount of time. You cannot present your PhD. So I've seen um, David has encouraged you to also take a topic which is related to the PhD. That's fine. That's good. Or to your master or bachelor or whatever uh, stage you're in. Um, that's fine. So that's also, of course, good because then you have a motivation to also explore the topic or to describe the topic even better. Uh, but for the presentation, keep it really simple. Focus on one specific equation or one aspect and try to describe it as well as possible and to motivate it as well as possible because that makes it much easier for the other one to uh, follow you. Uh, no one can actually really understand the topic of your PhD thesis within in like five minutes or eight minutes uh, that you really have to present uh, your topic. So that's just a small recommendation. Keep it really basic. And how long should such a presentation be? I mean, it, it can be around, your presentation can be around eight to 10 minutes, not more than that. That's really, okay. up, 10 minutes is really the upper limit because we also want to then, uh, you know, talk to you also and, and ask questions. And more than uh, 15 minutes uh, should not be used. So you see yourself, it should be eight slides more or less. All right. Uh, we just want to see that you have chosen a topic, you have uh, investigated it, and and that's it, right? So that's the uh, most important aspect. All right. Yeah, so uh, do you have any general questions about the, um, this part two on these locations? Yeah. So if you have, you can always ask, uh, but this would be the plan for the next uh, five or six uh, lectures. Okay, then let's go straight ahead into the lecture. Um, there are two books I want to recommend you if you want to know more um, about these locations. There is uh, the Bible, <laughs> I can say, uh, from Hirs and Lotte. Uh, which is very complete and contains a lot of um, dislocation theory. Um, here you find a lot of material and you can look up um, about dislocation uh, theories, whatever, almost uh, whatever you can come across. It is not a book that you can read easily in certain respects. And some parts are also not described uh, that well. For example, the Pius Navarro model is a little bit complicated. So uh, if you want to understand basic things about these locations, I can recommend Harlan Bacon, which is more an introduction to these locations as the title says. And it's more basic and is probably the better start if you want to uh, investigate some, some topic. Uh, the Hills and Lotte is maybe something which you will find very um, uh, good later. Uh, when you are already in uh, the theory of this location and you want to just uh, yeah, look up uh, some specific topic. 
but both books are very good. Uh, I can really recommend them. And I use materials from both books also. Okay, so let's start with uh, first dislocation theories. Um, yeah, everything started around uh, the turn of the century of the last century, so around 1900. Uh, if you want to have more information about historical development, there is this very nice um, paper on it, written by Hirth himself. Um, uh, but let's say the most essential thing is that everything started with, started with Timpa and Volterra um, around 1900. So Vito Volterra made his contribution in 1907. And uh, he also um, uh, started calling the defects that we are after distorsioni, which is an Italian uh, term for dislocations. Dislocation itself, the term was then coined later by Love. Uh, Volterra dislocation is a very important um, term because uh, people working on dislocation call Volterra dislocation whenever they think about this location in a linear elastic um, uh, sense. So what we will do in um, next lecture. Because Volterra has started actually to investigate what happens if you take a linear elastic medium and you have such a tube and you cut it, as you've seen here in this, uh, let me also switch on my pointer. If you make a cut and then you do all sorts of different displacements as shown, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? Uh, you can imagine making, introducing these defects. And then um, once you have introduced this defect, ask what is the stress and the strain in my material, right? So <laughs> that's what Vito Volterra has, has started doing. And this is basically a very fundamental uh, uh, work on these locations. Uh, which is very important to understand their properties. Um, we will only treat A, B, A, 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 sorry, we will treat B, C, and D because they correspond to edge and screws locations. The other type of defects are not relevant for us. We will not treat them. Uh, there are also defects where one can ask what is the stress and the strain inside and what is the energy that I need to uh, apply to create this defect but um, they are not relevant in terms of these locations. Yeah, so this was the start linear elastic description of uh, a defect which is created by cutting such a tube and making a displacement. Then a very seminal work was later uh, by Jakob Frankl, whom we see here, and uh, who was the first one to ask how about uh, theoretical shear strength? If I have a material and I start to apply uh, to, uh, to, to apply a load on this material, which results in stress, what would this material actually be able to withstand? And um, he has um, published his results where he speaks about a file model here. You can see this is German for the ones who know German. Um, um, yeah, where you imagine that your material actually inside is like a file where you have a periodic variation on a surface here. And you can imagine having another one. And if you start to slide these two files against each other, you would have um, a, a friction which will vary periodically, right? So he already started with this assumption that is very fundamental in dislocation theory that you need something like an energetic variation. And he called it uh, his, uh, a file model. Um, but we will see now in, on the next slide uh, that this is really very fundamental to understand uh, also a theoretical shear strength. At this stage, there was nothing known about this location. Uh, so it, it was not clear that strength actually is related to these locations. Vito Volterra has started investigating these locations, but not to know something about strength, but in order to understand conceptually what stress and strain in a linear elastic medium is if I do some sort of uh, distortion. Um, for Jakob Frankl, this was still not clear um, uh, how the strength of a material is actually given. And I will show you the concepts that basically are related to his uh, investigation 
uh, on the next slides. Maybe also interesting in terms of history is to, to remind also that essentially uh, knowledge that materials are composed are crystals and that you have atoms which sit on uh, a, a crystallographic in a crystallographic oriented way on a, on a lattice. Uh, that was quite young um, at this stage. So that was maybe like 10 years earlier that that was really proven by uh, uh, Max Laue and, and co-workers. Um, so it was basically that which has triggered then also these ideas on, on strength, which are related to crystal, crystalline order and forces in a crystal. Okay, so now I want to explain a little bit this very basic um, uh, concept of theoretical shear strength, right? In order to understand it, I, I have um, yeah, made it very basic here. Uh, we assume we have a model crystal, so uh, shown here, where we have a simple cubic lattice. So on every um, corner of the cube, we have um, an atom, so that this would be the unit cell here. And we have a lattice constant uh, or lattice parameter, which tells us how far the um, uh, atoms are spaced. And we have this, we can assume that this is now a big block of material consisting of many thousands or millions or even more of atoms. And now comes the very uh, crucial thing, which is related to the file model. We assume now that if I start to shear one plane uh, with respect to the other one rigidly, right? So I take one plane and shift all the atoms of that plane. And you have to imagine that you have a 3D material here. Uh, where we just see uh, the projection on one of the surfaces. But if you start rigidly displacing one of the layers with respect to the other one, you can have some sort of energy penalty that you will pay. And this is shown here, which is also periodic, right? Uh, and in, in a simplest assumption, it's just a sinusoidal uh, law, which is shown here. Um, where we assume that the energy per area, so the area is uh, the one which is actually associated to the plane, uh, which is normal here to the, uh, to the screen, um, that the energy per area is given by a cosine function, one minus the cosine, where we have x the displacement of the, the plane and a is the, the lattice parameter and um, yeah, two pi is inserted here to have it uh, also uh, consistent with the cosine. Um, the most important parameter of this function here is this alpha here, which is in generally material dependent, right? A stiffer material or yeah, stiff, a stronger material will have here a different alpha than a very soft material, but we don't know it yet. And uh, we would like actually to relate it to a materials parameter. Um, the, so the, an important assumption is that we have this periodic variation that is a, a cosine function. And the other one is that there is a material dependent parameter alpha, which then relates um, really to a material that we are interested in um, investigating. Now uh, we do a little bit of uh, considerations to get there where we want. So to have alpha uh, defined. So let's imagine we have now displacement of our cubic uh, crystal. One displacement here is homogeneous so that we just displace all planes now in the same way. We see here then uh, basically three displacements uh, on top of each other. And the other one is, um, a shear on one plane. So we assume that all this displacement that I'm showing here, which is given by X, on this bottom part is, be, is done by uh, basically on one, uh, between two, uh, in one step between two planes. And here we assume that it's happening between these four planes in three steps, right? And the energy, of course, uh, will change differently. And this is shown here. In this case, we have basically for the block that I'm showing here, three displacements. So this is why here is three. We have alpha, A is, uh, if I've just multiplied uh, from the uh, left side to the right. And then we have here also, since um, the displacement on every uh, plane or between every of this plane was is just a third of the total here, 
we have to divide by three. And if I look now for this homogeneous shear, what I would get if I was uh, to do it, it's shown here by this blue line, the homogeneous energy increase, right? If I limit myself to very small displacement, I can make a Taylor expansion of the cosine function and I end up with a parabola in principle. And so this is now uh, the realm of linear elasticity. And we see that we have a quadratic increase of the energy. So this is the scenario of homogeneous shear. If you have shear on one plane, it's much simpler. Then we have just uh, an energy penalty between these two planes here and the energy increase is essentially what we have uh, seen on the previous slide. And if I compare then, of course, there is a periodic variation here uh, happening for very small displacements. It's energetically favorable for the material to make homogeneous shear, as you can see here. But if I go far, it's also clear that then it will be better for a material to deform plastically on one plane, uh, as you can see here in this image. So essentially, if you start pulling uh, on the material and applying a force in the beginning, you will re uh, the material will respond homogeneously, uh, like also then described by linear elasticity. But at a certain stage, then you will have a plastic event where then the whole block will shift with respect to each other. Uh, or we, the, the, the upper part of these uh, blocks shown here will shift respect to the lower one. All right, so what are the stresses associated to these energies? Well, one can just now take the derivative with, with respect to x, and the expressions are shown here, again for homogeneous shear, for small x, uh, and also for shear on one plane. And we can see here the corresponding expression. So um, for the elastic uh, shear, it's then a, just a straight line, linear elasticity. Whereas if we consider uh, the shear on one plane, we have then also a sinusoidal variation with, um, uh, with X. Okay, and then we are almost done. We just have uh, essentially the most important part is this one here, because we can now relate this expression to what we know from linear elasticity. Uh, you have already gone through all these void notation and uh, elastic constants. So I'm just reminding this here. If you have a simple cubic uh, crystal, then this is the um, elastic tensor here, or these are the elastic constants. Um, if we apply shear in the way shown here, then the only non-zero component is in the void notation here will be the sixth uh, component of the uh, stress tensor. And if you now multiply uh, with the matrix, what you get is, uh, sorry, this is the, the strain in void notation, and this is the stress. So you get the stress in void notation is equal simply by multiplying this the strain vector with uh, the, the, the matrix. And so you get C for four times x divided 3a, because that is the strain in void notation. And now if you compare this expression here with this expression here, you see that they look very similar. And actually, they are identical if alpha here is chosen to be c for 4 times a divided by 2 pi squared. So we are now actually where we want it to be. We have now a relationship between alpha and the materials parameter because C44 is the elastic constant and depends on the material. A very stiff material will have a high C44 and a soft material will have a low one. So we have managed to relate now uh, alpha to uh, the material constant um, that is very handy because we, in general, these uh, uh, elastic constants are known uh, and can be used. And now we can use the expression for the um, uh, stress that we have and just uh, rewrite it by inserting alpha. And essentially, we have now an expression for the stress, how it develops. As I shear one block with respect to the other one, I can see that basically I get my sinusoidal variation of the stress. And the maximum is uh, given by C for 4 divided by 2 pi because uh, the sine function can be one at maximum. And that tells me now that 
the maximum stress that a material can withstand is actually simply C44 divided by two pi, which is very handy, right? So because the elastic constant itself is only uh, valid uh, for very small displacements where I don't have any plastic event, right? And now I have an estimate for the stress for the uh, for for the plastic event where I shear planes uh, with respect to each other, and I have an expression for the stress that I need to apply in order to achieve that. And so this is giving me now the theoretical strength or the ideal strength uh, is also called like this. And we see that more or less for our simple model, it's about one sixth of C44. Uh, and you can redo this uh, simulation for all the crystals, not simple cubic, but maybe you have a hexagonal or a, or a face center cubic crystal. And um, you can assume that you don't have a sinusoidal variation, but we have maybe uh, another um, uh, law, which is also periodic. Uh, but you will get then always by doing these variations, um, theoretical shear strength, which are between a fifth or one thirtieth of the uh, shear constant. And um, that it gives you basically the theoretical strength of a material. And uh, now if you go and do a microscopic experiment, uh, which is shown here in the middle, what you usually do then in a tensile test is that you apply a force on a microscopic uh, sample and you will then get um, a plastic response and you can see at which stress levels this plastic response really occurs, then uh, it was clear that um, the real strength is far, far away from the theoretical strength, right? Uh, real materials have much, much lower uh, uh, yield stresses. Um, and that was a big uh, discrepancy and a big question mark at this time, how one can actually explain that. because this reasoning is fine, uh, but the experimental validation or the experimental uh, confirmation was missing. If you look here, I've prepared a table for you here, where I show for several um, FCC and BCC materials, I show what C44 is. And so you can imagine uh, we are here in the range of uh, tenth of or one hundredth of gigapascal. If I divide by five or 30, I still end up uh, around yeah, still some gigapascal um, that I need uh, in order to really uh, shear planes with respect to each other, which is the, the highest uh, uh, stress which can be um, taken by the material. And if you really look what the critical result shear stress is in reality, then it is megapascal. So we are far, far away from that. Uh, for BCC, it's not as pronounced. BCC is a little bit more special, so it's not um, the deviation is not so dramatic, but still is also clearly evident. So there is no material, um, real material, microscopic uh, sample of a material which can really uh, give you a strength which is uh, 10 or 20 or 30 gigapascals. The only exception to this are whiskers where you have very small single crystals, uh, which are completely defect free, then uh, it has been shown that such whiskers can really show you this strength, but those materials have to be perfectly defect free uh, in order to uh, give you the theoretical shear strength. All right, and so the time was ripe in 1934 for the discovery of these locations which were proposed based on the shear uh, uh, the strength discrepancy, right? So we, you can see here that we have three uh, authors um, who wrote three different papers, uh, where two were in the same journal um, and another one um, in a different journal, but all in the same year, which have essentially proposed these locations. I show you here the images from them from the papers, uh, you can see the one of Taylor, which is already showing the process of introducing a dislocation in a crystal. And uh, this one is similar, but shown a little bit different. But what you can see is that um, uh, in all three papers, um, 
these locations have been proposed uh, as the defect which can resolve the shear uh, strength discrepancy. Um, the best uh, way of to, to explain why the strength is lower, we will see later that with the Pius Navarro model, it can be shown rigorously with math. But a um, very basic way of looking at it is actually when considering the carpet problem. So uh, you can see here that um, these uh, men are all, um, uh, they want to shift the carpet and the tables and, and seats on top of it. And they cannot do it because they're too heavy. So one has a genius idea that by introducing the defect here and just doing it once after, after uh, the other and lifting one table after the other, they are able, although there are only three, they are able to really displace the carpet and also everything on top of the carpet, uh, which uh, is impossible if they were just pulling directly on it. And it's uh, in, in the end, uh, very similar for these locations. You can shift a dislocation inside of a material already at much lower stresses if you break bonds one after the other, which is shown here in this um, uh, schematic. So you can imagine um, that you are applying a force on this block here, which shifts the top uh, layers to the left. And then at a certain stage, in the, in the beginning, you just deform. And instead of now shifting everything um, rigidly and shifting the whole block, which gives you the ideal shear strength, you do it differently. You just break bonds one after the other. And in this way, uh, um, uh, you introduce a dislocation, you move the dislocation, and that uh, happens at stresses which are much lower compared to the idea, to the stress that you have to um, invest if you want to break all bonds simultaneously. So I have a movie here which shows this also. Let me see whether I can play it. Uh -huh, does not play. Sorry, I have to ask here. Uh -huh. I think it doesn't work with the laser ah. pointer. Now, ah, okay, yeah, now it's working. Hoppala. Let me go back. Okay. Okay, this is ideal shear strength, right? You move all bonds simultaneously. That takes in materials 10 to 20 or 30 gigapascal in order to achieve that, right? This process needs a lot of stress in order to really accomplish that. And this now is, sorry, this is a little bit stupid that it, Okay, this was idea strength. And now the dislocation goes one after the other, breaks one bond after the other. And that happens at much lower stresses. In case of FCC, it's megapascals. In case of, uh, of BCC, it's hundreds of megapascals at very low temperatures, uh, or even one, uh, the highest um, uh, stress would be the one, uh, pile stress is the one of, of tungsten, there you need one gigapascal, but that's also true at very low temperatures. So in the end, these locations move already in the megapascal regime, uh, and that's then also the strength that one really can observe uh, of materials. Okay, so this is um, more or less I have a question. Yes, please. <laughs> First question. So uh, is the slip plane also known as uh, habitus plane? Is that the same? Uh, by saying habitus plane, uh, I it's know It's the that plane uh, which uh, doesn't move uh, while uh, this location is propagating through the material. Um, so the slip plane, I, I'm not sure whether I fully got your question, but the slip mm -hmm. plane in this case is the plane mm -hmm. which uh, defines the two blocks, right? One mm -hmm. block mm -hmm. with respect to the other one. And in this case, it's, it's, it's horizontal, I can show you. Mm -hmm. so, so in case of, of, of a shear, the habitus plane stays the same. So 
You know what I mean? Not exactly. If you what do you mean apply, by that? Yeah. If you apply a norm, a conventional shear, uh, the top and bottom layer, they will go like this, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the habitus plane is the is the plane which stays the way it is. So it doesn't move. And if we increase the shear, uh, we have seen that it is uh, energetically uh, more uh, better. That a whole uh, half plane moves by a, a, a burgers vector. Yeah. Yes. And is the plane, and my question is if the plane uh, which divides these two um, 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 parts of our considered material in two, two, is this the same as the habitus plane? So this was my question. I hope uh, you now got me better. <laughs> um, the, the, the plane is the, 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 the slip plane for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whether it is the habitus plane, uh, honestly, it depends how you define mm -hmm. the habit. So I'm not so mm -hmm. familiar with uh, the way you define the habitus mm -hmm, plane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so if we see at the homogeneous shear, uh, if we have like five layers, yeah, yes. uh, the middle layer won't move by applying homogeneous shear, yes. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And if shear on one plane gets energetically uh, more favorable, mm -hmm. uh, is this the plane? So the 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 third layer from the Ah, now, I, I think now I understand okay. what you mean. Okay, yeah. Let's assume we have five, so there is a middle uh, plane, mm -hmm. which middle, you yeah. could imagine mm -hmm. does not move. Mm -hmm. Although, mm -hmm. yeah, but you could imagine that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, would that then define where actually really, uh, which plane then is uh, the one mm -hmm. where the block starts to shear? Yes, uh, that's my question. That is not, that is not, um, that's not the case because... Okay. In order to, uh, what? so now this is going really into this model here, but mm -hmm. if you think about it, in order to really get the scenario that uh, one plane, that one block displaces rigidly, you need a fluctuation, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have, if you start and you just start deforming, 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 then the first will always be that all of all um, planes uh, move, right? All planes mm -hmm. move, all planes move. And then you reach the point, which is the um, intersection of the blue and the mm -hmm. and the pink. The red one. Mm -hmm. oh, pink. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can just tie uh, you know, up. Sorry. You reach this point here, mm -hmm. and starting from this point, now it is energetically favorable if the system jumps from this state mm -hmm. into this state, and that can happen on every plane, in principle, right? Mm -hmm. does, and whether that happens or not, in the end, you need some um, fluctuate. You need some disorder, right? Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. brings them, which decides which plane is then going to be the glide plane, really, the sleep or mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. But this can happen to all of them, all of them. Yeah, any any okay. plane could qualify for that. Yeah. Any, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I hope this answered the yes. question. Yes. Yes. Yeah? Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> we got into detail more than I thought. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. That's very good to have questions. I like that. I like it a lot. Okay, so I just have to consider also the time, but that's uh, please ask questions. I like it. Okay, so yeah, just a few things about these locations in general. We have seen um, these are the three dislocations, the three type of defects that we, uh, Volterra has uh, investigated that uh, are related to dislocations. These two are edge dislocations. Uh, so if you do this type of dis uh, displacement, you get an edge dislocation. And this, dislocate, this type of displacement and defect gives you a screw dislocation. If you go and look then into the material, into the crystal, you will see that edge dislocations look like this, what we have already seen, uh, that you have an extra half plane added here. You see that these atoms here, these atoms, they just terminate here and are not um, continued in the lower part. Uh, so this is the extra half plane. And this is also the reason why 
the symbol for these locations is shown like this here. So you have the vertical shows the extra half plane uh, and the horizontal shows the, the glide plane. Uh, so this is the edge dislocation. And both this displacement, we will see it in the next lecture, both of these displacements create such a dislocation. In both cases, it looks like this. Whereas if you do this type of um, shearing or this type of defect, you will get a spiral running through your material and that's a screw dislocation. The important thing is that in the case of the screw dislocation, uh, the displacement in the material are mainly parallel to the dislocation line. Whereas in this case of the edge dislocation, they are normal to the dislocation line. Uh, and uh, for the Burgess vector, this is really strictly true. We will see it uh, on the next slide that uh, in this case, the Burgess vector is parallel to the dislocation line. And in the case of edge dislocation, the um, Burgess vector is normal to the dislocation line. And here we have the Burgess vector definition. Uh, which is very important if you want to uh, uh, know what uh, the Burgess vector is. If you have an image of a dislocation, you can always yourself find it out very simply by doing an atom to atom path around the dislocated crystal. Here, here we have the dislocation inside. So you go, you start, for example, here at uh, M, if you go N, O, P, Q and you count how many steps you make. These are nearest neighbor distances in um, for a cubic uh, crystal, for example. And you do that in the dislocated um, material and surrounding the dislocation. And you do it in a perfect crystal without a dislocation. And you will see if you do the same amount of steps, you end not at the beginning, but you end uh, shifted. And the difference or the, the vector connecting your endpoint with your start point is the Burgess vector. This is the way you can always find out what the Burgess vector is. In the case of a screw dislocation, it is the same thing, but here it's shown a little bit three-dimensional to show uh, how this is done. You start again with M, N, O, P, Q, and if you do the same path in the pure material, you end with Q, which is not uh, the same point as M, and the vector connecting Q and M is the Burgess vector. There's one thing which makes the definition of the Burgess vector arbitrary, <laughs> is that you have to define the positive line sense, right? So we see here, the direction you run around, uh, here is, um, in the, uh, is clockwise, right? Uh, is defined with the positive line sense. If you were to define the line sense in the opposite direction, the Burgess vector would also turn out to be in the other direction. So up to this sense, uh, the, the orientation of the Burgess vector is well defined, but if you want to know, is it pointing now from M to Q or from Q to, Q to M, you have to also say what your positive line sense is. So you know probably the right hand rule. So you take your right hand and the thumb and you point uh, in the direction of your positive line sense. And the orientation of the path is then given by your hand. I hope you can see my hand. <laughs> uh, and it will tell you how you have to uh, uh, define the path, the orientation of the path. So if you look at this example here, you see that this um, uh, right hand rule is fulfilled, right? Uh, and that you have to always uh, think when you want to define the Burgess vector, um, that you have to define first the positive line sense. But otherwise, the procedure is very simple. A few other things about dislocations in general. Um, we have heard about edge dislocations and screw dislocations. Important is that you can have any sort of dislocation in between an edge and a screw dislocation, which is shown in this example here. Here in C, we go in and we have um, the Burgess vector. Um, for example, if we define the line sense uh, to go in here, uh, would point in this direction here. So it's, it's uh, normal to the dislocation line. And now we can imagine that the dislocation line bends over 
the Burgers vector will always remain constant. The Burgers vector cannot simply change, but the dislocation line can be curved and can um, change its direction. And therefore, here, since the Burgers vector is still pointing in the same direction, but now the line of the dislocation line is now parallel to the Burgers vector, we have here a screw dislocation. So you see the dislocation goes in here, goes out here, and changes its character along the way. Here it's a pure screw, here it's a pure edge, and in between it's a mixed dislocation. Uh, you can define, you can find the local Burgess vector with um, um, uh, this construction here. So you have a, a curved dislocation line. If you want to find at a specific point on this dislocation line, the Burgess vector, you can, what you can do is to make a closed uh, path uh, uh, enclosing the, the dislocation line and then just um, get the Burgess vector by adding the changes of the displacements along the path uh, with this integral. Okay, three uh, more things about dislocations which are good to know. That is, dislocations cannot uh, terminate or start in the bulk. Uh, from nowhere, so they always can just come from the surface or from a defect. A dislocation line cannot just end in, a, in, in the bulk. Um, Burgess vectors, as we have seen here, connect uh, nearest neighbor atoms in a simple uh, crystal. But if a crystal is more complex and has two different species, like for example, a B2 structure in a PCC uh, case, then you get actually um, super dislocations because then the um, uh, Burgess vector runs over maybe several nearest neighbor distances. And in this case, one uh, talks about a super dislocation. Uh, and in a similar way, um, Burgess vector can also be smaller than a nearest neighbor distance. And in this case, we talk about partial dislocations, uh, which are always connected to a defect. And we will discuss this quite extensively for the SCC crystal, where actually every dislocation consists of two partial dislocations surrounded by uh, surrounding a stacking fault. All right, uh, I'm just checking the time. We are a little bit, we are a little bit over time uh, to do the interactive, uh, but maybe we can still do it. Uh, uh, let's still try to do let's it. Let's do it. Let's, let's do, do it. it. Right? Okay. Um, direct proofs of existence of dislocations. Everything we have heard so far was indirect, right? But uh, dislocations were discovered indirectly. But direct proofs of dislocations are the bubble raft, uh, which is illustrative. It's very nice to look at it. And you can understand very well. And you have a dislocation directly uh, in front of you. Uh, but the workhorse for the uh, and the scientifically um, uh, best way to investigate these locations is actually via TM transmission electron microscopy. And now let's go to the more practical thing. So bubble raft is a lot of fun. I have tried it. If you want to try it, you could even make your student presentations on uh, on, on making a bubble raft and 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 identifying these locations inside. Um, what you have to do is to you make a, a, a soap solution, where, which creates a lot of uh, bubbles, and then the bubbles create a crystal structure and also crystal defects, and you can find these locations in this way. I have two examples here, and I think you have, now it would be nice if you could just take these images and guess where the dislocation is found in the two cases. Let's start with this uh, image here. If you can copy and paste it into somewhere and just mark where you think the dislocation is located and share it with your student, with your colleagues and also with me. I give you a little bit of time. And the same thing also here, here it's more complicated. Here we have more defects, not just a dislocation, but there's also a very nice dislocation inside. Uh, if you need uh, help in finding it, what helps is to look at um, at the um, image from from um, from an angle. So uh, I will not show it to you because then the camera is all <laughs> tilted. But if you look at an angle, you will find the dislocation very easily 
because you can see the distortion of the plane. Okay, is it uh, working out for you? Anyone already has a suggestion for the first image that can be shared? Yes, I think so. I could share it. Ah, there's already, okay, Tobias was able to draw into my slide. That's very uh -huh. good. But only if just share with us, I will stop sharing and you can. Yes, I think I have the same um, result with here. It is. I think you can see it. Yes, so, exactly, exactly, yeah. So yeah. where we write. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Ja, uh, can you uh, can you share again? Can you mark the glide plane? Oh, sorry. One moment. Um, the glide plane must be in this direction. Is it this direction? Yes, that's the glide plane. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what? Where is the added half plane? Sorry. So we have uh, this is an edge dislocation, right? Where is the added half plane? So where you on which side um, do you think is the half plane added? So this. Wait a second. Um. Yes. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this is and the this, 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 this is, is the here, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's up or down. I would say um, up. Up, it's up. It looks mm -hmm. here a little bit different. Uh, it does not look like the example with a simple cubic structure because this is not simple cubic. So mm -hmm. the bubble raft creates a lattice, which is not simple cubic. It's actually a hexagonal lattice, right? And um, for that reason, it has this particular type of structure, but it's true that the atom on top that you are marking is the first atom of the added half plane. And then the added half plane is not straight, but it would be a zigzag. That is the amount of atoms that you have inserted on top with respect to the lower part, yeah. Okay. okay. Ah, thanks, Tobias. Yeah, yeah, Tobias. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and it, the other, and the other one, the other image, who wants to go on with the other? Wow. This one was too hot, too many bubbles. <laughs> but I think I have a guess, but I'm not sure if I want to uh, tell you. <laughs> Be brave, Be just brave. go ahead. Yeah, but uh, I didn't, I didn't no, wait, uh, I can, I can share make a, a, a screenshot because I, I, I found out uh, about the, the way I can uh, yeah, yeah, something yeah. Wait, in I, will, I will share again and you can just do it directly in my how do you draw actually how do you do that yeah um there's an option if you share the screen uh mm -hmm. right oh on God. the top of the screen there's option and anzeigen and then commentieren mm -hmm. and then one can yeah draw something in a particular uh, color or uh, do some tricks with mm -hmm. ah, yeah, yeah. symbols, okay. text, also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Can you, yeah. Where is the dislocation? I, I, I don't know. I guess somewhere like here. <laughs> no. Here is a lot of mess, uh, mm -hmm. but this is not the dislocate. There is one uh, in the same way, beautiful as the other one. Mm -hmm. I think I found it. Yeah. It's, how does it work with the comment? It's right here, I think. Exactly, yes, you got uh, it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. Light plane here, and yeah. it should run like this, the, the additional half plane. Yes, exactly. You got it. Very but it nice. was tricky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, so this is exactly uh, the dislocation that is in that image. There, there is a lot, there is even a, a, an interstitial, or no, there's a vacancy at the bottom. Maybe I can also draw here, right? 
you see there's a vacancy and there's even an interstitial here, right? You can see a lot of crystal defects. Um, I think here we have, I don't know exactly what it is, but it looks like a grain. I have to still think what kind of defect this is. But um, this is a very nice dislocation uh, that you have identified, yeah. All right. And since we are basically at the end of the time, I will, uh, I, su I suggest we stop here. We can do TM next week. Uh, I don't want to rush over it now in one minute, uh, but take a little bit of time because it's really the most important technique for this location uh, imaging. So we do it next time. All right. Okay, so I will stop sharing now the screen. Do you have any questions? Not for the moment. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember I, I had a question. Yes. Um, so uh, can we say that we can uh, depict any dislocation as a superposition of edge and screw dislocations? Yes, you can. Um, you can say that, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, what cannot be said is that uh, the energy of the mixed dislocation is the addition of the screw and the edge dislocation. Is it like some way, something with uh, Pythagoras theorem? Because uh, that might be uh, it, the it, resulting it, direction mm -hmm. of the dislocation, of the mixed dislocation. Um, it's actually related to um, the assumption of linear elasticity. So if mm -hmm. you describe a dislocation in a linear elastic picture, then you can add um, the displacements and the stresses and the strains always because it's mm -hmm. linear elasticity. So if you have one solution, you can also uh, have a second solution by adding two of them together. If you have two solutions separate, you can get the solution also by combining it, but not the energy. I, I will okay. treat that. So, okay. uh, but with the stresses and the displacements are, you can additive. make a linear addition, uh, linear addition, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I will say more about this next uh, next time. And in reality, non, uh, no dislocation is, uh, or no material is linear elastic in the dislocation core it's not linear elastic and therefore um, it's not really valid. Let's say um, if you take also into account the core energy is not valid then that you can linearly add uh, the displacements uh, or the stress. So not even displacements and stress can be linearly added in the core, but outside of the core. And that is very quickly that you reach that level within a few uh, atomic distances, you are already in the regime of linear elasticity, there you can really add them. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for attending and Thank I you. will meet you then next week again. Um, I will post the dates so everyone is informed and uh, please think about your student topics if you don't have uh, one already and just uh, post it in the Moodle. All right. See you very soon. <laughs> okay. Right. Bye. 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 See you next week. Bye.